Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. Today I've got a little bit of a different video for you because today we're going to be doing some software engineering, a little bit of design, a little bit of architecture stuff. So we've been working a lot in this uh, function here, draw, test, triangle. Well, it doesn't draw a triangle anymore, it draws a cube, but you get the freaking idea, right? Uh, but I mean, we've got all of our code chilling out here in a single function. It's bad organization and furthermore, Every time we have to draw a cube, we've got to create and destroy all of these things, all of these buffers and shaders, and that is a lot of wasted effort. And it's not a big deal right now because we're only drawing one cube per frame, but if you were drawing 100 cubes per frame, your frame rate would slow down to a freaking crawl. So our goal here today is to create a system that allow us to persist these objects across frames. We don't create them every single frame stuff like our shaders, like our buffers, etc. And there are simpler ways to do it and there are more advanced ways to do it. I'm going to show you a little bit more of a sophisticated system that is going to give us a lot more flexibility, but it's also got a little bit more uh, high-minded concepts front-loaded. You'll see what I mean in a second. So here's an overview of the system that we're going to create. It's basic uh, UML class diagram. Try not to shit your pants if you're not used to class diagrams. It's not that difficult. I'm going to explain it right now. So, um, we've got a bunch of different uh, things that can be bound to the pipeline. Things like your shaders, like your buffers, layouts, um, state objects, etc. And we want to bring them all under a uniform interface so that we can treat them uniformly when we uh, draw our entities. So we create uh, basically an abstract class bindable, has a virtual function bind, and uh, it takes a graphics object and it will bind the current bindable thing to that pipeline. Uh, and then classes will inherit from that and they will implement the bind interface with the logic required to bind that particular resource. Then on the other side here, you've got your entities that are drawable, we call them drawable. And uh, drawable entities will be comprised of one or more bindable things. So every drawable obviously is going to need a pixel shader and a vertex shader. It's going to need an input layout and it's going to need things like constant buffers. So it's going to have a collection of bindables. And when you call draw, it will call bind on each of the bindables in its collection, bind everything that it needs to the pipeline, and then call draw on graphics. Now the beauty of this system is because all these guys, all these bindables are under a single interface, you can put them all in a single homogeneous container like a uh, vector and um, you can call draw just in a loop on every object in that vector and it doesn't matter what combination of bindables you have because some drawables are going to have things like textures but other ones might not have a texture. Some might have um, a geometry shader but others might not. And by doing things like this, by making your bindable uh, dynamic and polymorphic, you have complete freedom in the combination of bindables that every individual drawable will have. So of course with this system, you get the persistence that we were uh, looking for. You also get reusability because all these objects are their separate classes and separate files, and they can be reused in different, um, in different things that inherit from drawable. Everything's organized into separate classes, it's all under a uniform interface. You've got flexibility in your composition, in what bindables you can include in any specific drawable object. You've got very good decoupling. Drawable doesn't need to know anything about the direct 3D details of these bind operations. All it does is it knows that it can call bind and shit will get done. And you also get reduction of uh, some boilerplate copy pasta code because uh, this draw function is implemented in drawable and uh, it's the same for any kind of um, Entity that inherits on drawable so you don't have to implement a draw function for box and you know for I don't know sphere or whatever object you got pube That's all implemented up here in the base class and that's going to reduce your boilerplate code quite a bit Now there's a little bit of additional hanky-panky that goes in here with the uh, the transformation constant buffer but uh, we will cross that bridge when we come to it. Let's take a look at the code. All right, so the first thing I did is a very simple uh, organizational change. I created header files to store those macros that we use for throwing exceptions, the graphic macros and the Windows macros. And so I pulled those macros out of the files that they were in 
and I put them in their own header file, and then I just include that header file wherever those macros are required. So here, all this stuff is turned into throw graphics macros. The reason why I did this is because our concrete bindable classes here, they're also going to be throwing those kinds of exceptions, so they're gonna need access to those macros. And instead of copy and pasting them like I've been doing so far, it's much better to put them in a single implementation header file and use the preprocessor to copy and paste them. Now the next commit here is pretty huge, so instead of, you know, just looking at the change list, it's probably better if I just check it out. So if we look at the solution explorer here, we can notice right away I've added a little bit of um, organization into the system here. Uh, this is where I put the macros for the exceptions. And here we have separate filters for bindable and drawable. So let's start with bindable. Like I showed you in the diagram, it's a very basic interface class. It sets the stage for this bind function that will be implemented by its children. And also, of course, you're gonna need your virtual destructor when you're doing polymorphism. Now, these guys down here, this is a little bit of, uh, it's a, little bit of a design trick in C++. So all of these guys here, all these concrete bindables, they're gonna get passed in graphics and they're gonna need access to things that are private to graphics. They're gonna need access to the pointer to the device and the pointer to the context. And one more thing that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but those are private, right? Now, one way you could solve this is by making graphics, by making all of these guys friends of graphics. And then they would all have access to graphics internals. But I don't want them to, I don't want to give them full access. And I don't, I also don't want to have to type in a new friend declaration for every new bindable that I add. That's annoying. So what I do is I do a little, a neat little trick that I'm going to show you right now. I make the base class a friend. And you might think if the base class is a friend, then the children will also be friends, but that's not true. Base class is friend, children don't get that friend relationship. So what you do is in the base class, you create some functions that can crack open specific parts of graphics and make them uh, available to the children. So with this protected visibility, these static functions will only be available to the children of bindable. And the bindable, children can use these functions to get specific parts of graphics, only the parts that we want to give them access to, which are the context, the device, and the info manager. And then in these child classes, all you gotta do, you look in the implementation here, and all you do is you call get context on the graphics that was passed in, that gets you access to the context pointer, and then you can call your direct 3D functions on that. Now I'm not gonna go over all the implementations of all these bindables line by line because it's just the code that we've already seen in draw test triangle, basically copy and pasted into separate classes. The basic design philosophy is for every one of these guys, in the constructor, you create the resource and you store the direct 3D interface handle into some, you know, member data like this. The constructor takes care of that, and then in the virtual bind function, you get the context and you call the, bind, the proper bind function for that resource type. Every bindable knows its own procedure for its own creation and its own bind operation. Everything is nicely encapsulated within that class. The people who use these bindables, they don't need to know all those details, they just need to know that when they call bind, shit gets bound. Now there are a couple little details that I want to go over here. One of them is InfoMan. Uh, so this is a macro I created. Basically, these macros, like graphics throw info, they expect in the, uh, in the current scope that the info manager is available. And that works inside of graphics because graphics has info manager as a member variable, but outside of there, there is no info manager. So what you got to do is you've got to import info manager into the current scope. So if we look at macros and we go into graphics throw macros, I've added info manager here. And what it does is if we are not debug mode, it just uh, declares H result because that's needed by some of these macros. But if we are in debug mode, it declares H result and it also declares a reference to info manager in the current scope. And it sets that equal to get info manager on the graphics object. So that means that you have to, a function has to exist called get info manager when you use this macro. And this macro will import info manager into the current scope. 
And you can see that the base class bindable has a function get info manager. And so when we use this macro info man, it will create in the scope a reference to the info manager and that will allow this macro to work properly. It's just a little bit of macro bullshit to reduce the amount of boilerplate code that I have to inject into each of these methods. Now most of these things like the index buffer, input layout, they're just normal classes that inherit from bindable. But there are some that are a little special. Think about, for example, the vertex buffer. The vertex buffer, it is a buffer of vertex types that are defined by us. So to make it uh, fully flexible, we're going to use some templating and we're going to template only the constructor on the vertex type. So it's going to take a vector of vertices of type V and then it will use that template information that it gets to determine the size of that for when it creates the, uh, the vertex buffer. And you can see the same thing for constant buffers because constant buffers, again, that's a structure that uh, we define ourselves. So there I template the entire class on that. And the constant buffer, it's a little more of an interesting situation because there are two types of constant buffers, right? There's the vertex contents buffer and the pixel constant buffer, and there'll be other ones in the future. Um, so what I do is constant buffers, they can be updated every frame. That's what, how you usually use them. So all constant buffers should have an update function, which I show here. Up until now, this hasn't been necessary because we've just been creating the constant buffer every frame and destroying it at the end of the frame. But uh, to update a constant, there's a function on the context called map. And when you map a resource, you basically lock it and get a pointer to that memory. Then you can write into the memory. And when you're done writing, you call unmap. You can see here map is just a uh, member function of the interface for the device context. You can look it up on MSDN to get all the nitty gritty details. Map sub resource is just the structure that gets filled with the data after the resource has been locked and that is where you get the pointer from. Use that pointer to copy data into the sub resource. So again, every constant buffer, it's going to have the same update uh, procedure. It's going to have the same creation procedure. The only thing that really changes between constant buffers is the procedure for binding because for a vertex content buffer, you're going to bind it to vertex shader. For a pixel shader constant buffer, you're going to sh bind it to the pixel shader. So I just use inheritance to differentiate that small amount of difference between these functions here. You can also notice there's a small difference here between, uh, there's two constructors for constant buffer. One is where you're initializing it with some constant buffer data. And another one is where you're creating a constant buffer without initializing it. And just one small note, one little uh, language quirk that I ran into here. When you're inheriting with templates, and you want to access the protected member of a parent class. Um, well, let me show you what happens if I get rid of these using. If I try to build this now, I get a bunch of errors that say get context cannot be found and p context buffer identifier not found. It can't find these guys in the parent class basically due to some bullshit with template inheritance. So what you can do is you can either do this pointer to get context and that'll work or you can explicitly import those names using uh, using declaration you can also fully qualify them with uh, colon double colon but i i prefer this one this is my my preferred methodology you do whatever you want to do now we're not quite finished with bindable yet but let's take a look at uh, the drawable side of things and that'll kind of see how the whole picture ties together nicely so the drawable base class it is going to provide the container that houses all of the bindables and it will also provide the logic required to draw a drawable. So if we look in the drawable filter here, we've got the drawable base class and it defines a bunch of uh, functions here or declares, I should say. One that we're interested in right now is uh, draw and also add bind and add index buffer. So if we look at the implementation for draw, it couldn't be simpler, right? We just loop through all of our bindables and we bind them all. And then we call draw indexed on the graphics object. And we got to pass it the number of uh, indices in our index buffer. So this is the reason why our drawable also maintains a separate constant pointer. This is a non-owning pointer, only a reference to the index buffer because among the bindables, one of them is going to be an index buffer and we need that count of the index buffer 
in order to properly call draw indexed. By the way, draw indexed is just a uh, function that we added to graphics. And as you can expect, it just calls draw indexed on the context. So draw is simple. Now we've got two functions here that the, the, uh, the children of this class, the inheritors, will use to add bindables to the collection of bindables. So one is add bind, very simple, just pushes back and it moves the unique pointer. Notice that we're, we're storing them, the bindables, as unique pointers because well, obviously we need polymorphism. So add bind is super simple. And add index buffer is basically the same as add bind, only it also sets up that reference to the index buffer that we needed before. So here, we, we call this one when we're adding an index buffer, and we call this one when we're adding anything else. And I use some asserts here to make sure that you don't fuck it up. So here, we check the type ID, we make sure that we're not trying to add an index buffer with this function here. And in this one here, we make sure that we're not trying to add an index buffer when we've already added an index buffer. So we can use the, uh, the p index buffer, the dumb pointer, to do that check. Now let's look at an actual concrete class that uh, inherits from drawable. So we have box. And what box is going to do is it, it, well the constructor is going to generate a box with a bunch of parameters. This is all parameters having to do with the, the movement of the box basically. Here's its position, a bunch of angles around the center, and a radius, distance from the center, the origin of the world space, and then here are the, the angular speeds that it's going to be moving. These ones are about rotation about the box's center, and these ones are about rotation about the center of the world space. Besides the constructor, it also implements an update function that will update this information about our entity and a function that will get the transform as a DirectX math XM matrix. And then in the constructor, we get uh, an RNG, we get a bunch of distributions, and we use those to initialize all the parameters of our box. And then in here, in the body, we're going to create all of our bindables. So we define things like the, the type of vertex and the vertex data, and then we use add bind, and we create new vertex buffer here. New vertex shader, pixel shader, all that stuff. Notice for index buffer here, we're using add index buffer. Another thing to note is that the vertex shader here, um, in order to create the, uh, the layout, you need the vertex shader bytecode, that blob. And so the vertex shader has a, an interface or a function on it, get bytecode. And so we create the vertex shader, we get the bytecode of that, and we use that later on for the, uh, the input layout. But yeah, it's basically the same idea as what we had in the, uh, the draw test triangle function. And then for update, all we do is we, we take in a delta time and we update the angles. And for get transform, we just concatenate a bunch of matrices. So we rotate around the box's center, then we translate the box away from the origin, then we rotate around the origin, and then we translate the box away from the camera a little bit, because we don't want it all up in our grill. And this function is going to be essential in the final piece of the puzzle here. Uh, and that has to do with the transform. And this function here is essential to the final piece of the puzzle that I have been leaving up until now. And that is this guy here, trans C buff. It's a little, it looks a little funky compared to the other parts of the diagram. And uh, well, let's let's go into that a little bit. So for our current vertex shader, uh, we've got one constant buffer, and that holds the transformation matrix that is going to be applied to each of the vertices. Uh, now that transformation matrix has got to be built based on basically the position of our box in the world. Now there's a number of ways we could ap approach this problem. Uh, basically, this, the steps of what we have to do is we have to update the constant buffer with the new matrix, and then we have to bind it to the, um, the pipeline. But um, currently, our drawable, it just has a big collection of bindables. It doesn't know which one is the, uh, the translation constant buffer. So it doesn't really know which one it has to set the matrix on. And as a num another point is that the, uh, the base drawable doesn't really have the information necessary to generate the matrix that's generated in the children. Now I've come up with a little sneaky little design that automates the whole process. So what we're going to do is for the transformation constant buffer, 
uh, you might think it would inherit from the vertex contents buffer because it is a vertex constant buffer. But no, we inherit it directly from bindable. And then we include as a composition element, we include a vertex constant buffer inside of our transformation constant buffer. And the transformation constant buffer is going to maintain a reference, constant reference to the drawable, to its parent, the drawable that it is contained within. So it has a reference back to its parent. And what it does is whenever you call bind on your transformation constant buffer, uh, the transformation constant buffer is going to get the transform from its parent, then is going to update the constant buffer that is inside of it, and then it is going to bind that constant buffer to the pipeline. So if we take a look at the code, you see it has a reference, constant reference to a drawable, and it maintains a uh, vertex constant buffer inside of itself. The constructor is very simple. You set the reference to the parent, and you construct the internal vertex constant buffer. And then when it's time to bind, you first call update on your vertex constant buffer by getting the transform of the parent and getting the projection matrix that is stored in the graphics object. Uh, so in graphics, I have two functions, get projection and set projection. And those are used by transform constant buffer to create the final uh, matrix that is used by the vertex shader, which is built based upon the projection concatenated with the transform buffer of the actual uh, drawable that is being drawn. And then after you've updated the vertex constant buffer, you then bind that to the graphics object. And there you go. There's a little uh, example of using composition and inheritance together nicely to uh, solve a problem. Very automatic. Don't have to do any kludgy stuff where I, uh, where I would have to include another pointer like this one as a special pointer to uh, the transformation constant buffer. No. It all just works automatically when you call bind on, on the transformation constant buffer. It automatically grabs the matrix from its parent, sets that, updates the vertex buffer, and then binds the vertex buffer. Completely automated. And then quickly at the top level, you can see I've added a vector of boxes. And in app.cpp, I create a bunch of uh, random stuffs. And in a loop, I just create a bunch of boxes. I also set the projection matrix for the graphics and then in app.go or in draw frame, get the delta time, clear the buffer, update and draw all your boxes and end your frame. Top level logic here could not be simpler and cleaner. And when you run that, you get your boxes flying around in space, rotating around their centers, rotating around the center of the universe. It's all good. But that's going to about do it for this video. In part two of this tutorial, we are going to move ahead. We're going to improve this system that we've built and we're going to reduce a lot of the redundancy that we have with these binds. So stay tuned for that. And also keep in mind that all this code is available on GitHub. So if you're interested in any of the details of the design, I highly recommend you check out the code for yourself. As always, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more Hardware 3D.